students. So I think it's just a few minutes I will be doing and showing the next time we look at this virtual muscle. It will be not just muscle but a very important kind of metabolic organ. So we know it's a primary store, protein store in the body and it's a reservoir continuously creates amino acids and puts it into the circulation and gets it replaced whenever the skin, liver, heart, brain are using these proteins. We are aware about the 80% glucose disposal which is being taken up by muscle mass, which we are very much aware of. And we know all these things happen and we see it in starvation and bones and everywhere. But the protein synthesis is the major, major work of the skeletal protein, skeletal muscles and it's a big reservoir. In diabetes, there are some differences and there are many population-based studies which have shown that sarcopenia, age-related loss of muscle mass and function, forget about the definition of 70 years old, that it starts from the age of 30 to 40. Then there are lots of issues with sarcopenia, falls, loss of functional ability, ability reduction of quality of life. It creates a large functional costs in the data in the last two, three years, the billions of dollars in US and UK data. The difference in the diabetics and non-diabetics, like if you say type 2 diabetic, muscle quality, that is strength of the muscle per unit of muscle mass is 7 to 8 percent lower in diabetics. Risk of low relative muscle mass, that is in comparison with the height and the total weight, is two to fold higher the risk of low relative muscle mass in diabetes. The age related loss of muscle mass, strength and function and the quality is 30 percent faster if someone gets diabetes. All this is exaggerated, absolutely really. So we need to aware when we treat all these, our friends with type 2 diabetes. The population based studies again have shown the relationship to the bidirectional, high muscle mass, high muscle to fat mass ratio, high muscle strength are associated with less insulin resistance in a variety of population based studies. Low muscle strength is associated with higher prevalence of type 2 diabetes in different ethnicities. You can see there is a big data which was done in Korean study, which is more than two languages. Skeletal muscle index, again a measure of relative muscle mass, is negatively associated with incidence of type 2 diabetes. So we know it has some relationship with the low. It's not only insulin resistance which we talk about, but insulin sensitivity when we talk about skeletal Association of grip strength, which is a chronometer, the clinics which we do. How does it predict cardiovascular health or other health otherwise? It's a very good kind of a study done with lots of data. It shows that from the UK Biobank, half a million participants, when they were studied, low grip strength was associated with increased all cause mortality, cardiovascular disease, high respiratory disease, high cancers. So, in general, if the low grip strength is there, is associated with poor health. It can also predict cardiovascular disease. So if you add low grip strength or a grip strength in the standard measurement of predicting cardiovascular disease, it is almost as good as the celiac protein they are adding to the or lipoprotein they are adding to the risk predicting scores. The excess risk of this cardiovascular disease mortality in type 2 diabetes is attenuated with a high grip strength. It's a bidirectional kind of a relationship. This is a good meta-analysis done from the Jacob Taft about the cardiorespiratory fitness and muscle strength, especially in type 2 diabetes. So when controlled for adiposity, each standard deviation higher muscle strength is associated with 24% lower risk of type 2 diabetes. If you adjust for adiposity, still 13% lower risk of type 2 diabetes. And the association may be positive in some of the kind of research, which that's why I'm saying the relationship can be bidirectional. I'll come to that, that what this skeletal muscle is doing. So low muscle quality and the mass, we call it a sarcopenia. Is there are lots of mechanism why it is a metabolic disease? It's associated with insulin resistance. There are the myokines, I will talk about it in the next slide, associated with chronic inflammation. Associated vitamin D deficiency and physical inactivity, which all lead to metabolic syndrome, diabetes, chronic fatty liver disease, and of course cardiovascular disease. There's a lot of research and papers will come out that what skeletal muscles are doing. If you are talking about myokines, the skeletal muscle is like this is a physiology. We 
which we are revisiting is a metabolically active organ. It's not only creating pores and the movements. It interacts with other organs through secretory proteins, myokines. They are secreted in response of not only muscle contraction but the strength training. And these like for example muslin paracrine myokine it actually promotes hyperagama dependent fat browning which we know that it improves metabolic health. IL-6 which has so many important functions in the liver it improves beta cell function, it improves insulin secretion, promotes glucose uptake, promotes fat oxidation everywhere. So it's a very good kind of a thin IL-6 which goes down if the muscle strength or the muscle mass is going down. Irisin it improves hepatic steatosis and decreases body weight. So if the muscle, skeletal muscle organ is not good, which goes to the chronic fatty liver disease. And the chronic inflammation associated with loss of muscle mass is again, it increases pro-inflammatory cytokines, CRP, ENF, alpha, nuclear factor kappa B, which all lead to majority of the metabolic problems and the mainly NFLD, that is chronic fatty liver disease. So huge data, lots of studies that sarcopenia or less muscle mass, less functional muscle, they contribute to the progression of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and this is a, again it's a bi-directional, it can be, it also has a positive relationship with the metabolically associated chronic liver disease. We know about metabolic syndrome, we are doing a good job, we are using statins, good MSC control, good blood pressure control. We are using good drugs. I am not saying in India it is going down, but the UK and the USA studies that cardiovascular events are going down except heart failure. But other things we are doing, we are focusing on that when we are treating type 2 diabetes. What about liver? It's still, we are not really doing that great job which should be done in the clinics of diabetes clinics. It has a kind of close relationship with the muscle, skeletal muscle mass, and with the low skeletal muscle mass is linked to increased odds ratio for NAFLD in, in several meta-analysis and again the relationship as I said can be positive. Now managing obesity is a major major focus, weight loss or weight management is a major focus, the major pillar of type 2 diabetes. The science progresses, we always criticize the new drugs or the trials but whatever we see is from 2012 first published in Paragin, Copenhagen. It was from AGIT to inhibitor, we realized what is heart failure. We realize what our myocardial cells are doing, what is kidney is doing, how the glomeruli are functioning. Our knowledge of type 2 diabetes increased so much after this trial. The GLP-1 analogs came and then we are all are using dual, triple, agonist and there is a major weight. We still don't have that great drugs in India for day-to-day -day practice, but soon they will be available. And we are seeing results across the world with a great weight loss are enjoying as a like the magic magic drugs but the cure which we are seeing with the weight loss the great improvement in everything whether you say cardiovascular risk and other risks which this weight loss is, can be a worse than the disease so it's a warning and this paper is just few months back managing obesity can lead to such a major problem i think everyone should go through it there is an editorial in the same paper which gives a very good comments Incretin based drugs have a demonstrated unprecedented efficacy in weight loss trials, but ensuring that healthy body weight can be maintained is fundamental to sustainable to good health. And when we say healthy body weight, we say about skeletal muscle mass and its function. So largely ignored aspect of weight loss is whenever weight loss is happening, whether it's a pharmacological or whether it's a lifestyle intervention, whether it's a crash diet or a dietary programs, usually there is a weight loss comprises of loss and 35 percent of weight loss in any program whether it is drug or lifestyle the 35 percent weight loss is the muscle loss and we all know that whenever there is a weight regain there is always a weight regain we know everything about it appetite centers and the regulation the regain is almost entirely fat so where are we coming people with chronic obesity often lose and regain weight in repeated cycles at risk of developing catabolic obesity each time they are beginning weight, they are gaining only fat. Which this aspect of management of weight, I think we are not focusing. Let's be candid, and we are not that much kind of involved in the improvement of skeletal muscle health. So these drugs should not be like magic pill. 
it should be associated with very good skeletal muscle health management whenever we are taking and forget about hgf even simple hgf to individual so much of muscle loss happens in individuals patients don't like it and then we also see that there are issues with that so they should be used the weight loss intervention with diet and exercise safely some kind of a management things which can help the muscles so muscle um, muscle size as well as the muscle function should be focused to improve the skeletal muscle health to deal with all the problems there are lots of mitochondrial adaptations when we do the exercise training there is a great research and great kind of data on that so what i see always we divide type two diabetes complication microvascular microvascular So all diabetes clinics will have the screening, the scope, and the eye, and everything. And we screen the patients for the cardiac stress test, echo, and calcium scores, and everything. Now we are focusing on heart failure. Otherwise, heart failure was just clubbed as a one cardiovascular risk. It is not true. Heart failure cannot be used as a cardiovascular complication. It is different altogether. So is it correct to classify as a micro and micro? I don't think so. We need to change this the way we classify our diabetes. This changing mode of death in type two diabetes. It's more like heart failure, cancer. Do we screen regularly each and every type two diabetic patient for cancer? I don't think so. We just advise, but we are not aggressive in that. Chronic liver disease we have started. It should be done more kind of with stringent kind of a things in all the clinics. Sarcopenia, skeletal muscle health, cognitive dysfunction. These all are different complications of type two diabetes, which are neglected. Which are not getting proper attentions. So there is nothing as a microvascular or micro hypertension itself is a microvascular complication. It affects the small arteries, which affect everything inversely. So heart failure is altogether different. Diabetic kidney disease is no more a microvascular complication as its own diabetic kidney disease. Neuropathy and lots of mitochondrial problems at the synapse level. So it, it is there at any diabetic stage also. So we need to change these complications, and we, each problem in type two diabetes has to be looked after properly. And then, of course, the skeletal muscle as an organ should not be its a metabolic organ should be used to treat diabetes, not only just as a glucosal kind of organ which we look at it. We are doing exercise with the glucose, but we can use this organ to improve health, to reduce the burden, reduce chronic fatty liver disease and cardiovascular disease. So just at the end, I thought I have two minutes uh, because we were talking about skeletal muscles. I thought of just touching and introducing you. Everyone knows it created a big, big kind of a turmoil in the internet with this article in 2022 by Eric Hamilton about soleus muscle. So most of you must have read it, but if not, at least some basics what he has done about soleus muscle, which was very interesting. So I thought I will show you about in two minutes. So soleus muscle, there are almost so many 600 muscles combined. They contribute 15 percent of the whole body oxidative metabolism. What happens? Muscle fiber in much each muscle are different. In soleus, there are type one slow twitch fibers. What are these different fibers? That even repetitive stimulation and contraction, there is no fatigue in this muscle. So there are these kind of fibers in some muscles. So continuous contraction, there is no fatigue. Clinically tested, which is very interesting, and then there are some particular things happening in soleus muscle that some intrinsic properties that it has a blood circulation which has an enhanced delivery of blood-borne fluid. So soleus muscle, when it contracts, it doesn't use glycogen. It doesn't use glycogen. It uses blood-borne glucose, DNA, potassium, and oxygen. So it takes up the glucose from the blood whenever the soleus is contracting. So I think it was very interesting, and then he did studies in volunteers, which are not very great fitness freaks. They are simple people, elderly, who are not doing lots of exercise. And what he showed that with the soleus muscle contraction, you can see that use of glycogen is such a small. All the fuels are used from the other part, mainly from the blood. So in the postprandial state, the whole body is moving, but the soleus muscle can alone reduce the glucose to 50%. Glucose load. You can see soleus push-up contractions here. They are also using whole body oxygen consumption is much more. And you can see medial gastrocnemius. 
metal that struck me is from the you know thing, much less what is working in soleus muscle in soleus muscle which we have used the Hamilton has used in the trial you will see it works same as a walking or running or cycling you know it doesn't happen when you are walking only this much of oxygen consumption running this much but just soleus push-ups even though someone is sitting it is such a higher consumption happening and so Maybe we need to use, it's difficult to do four hours kind of a contraction while sitting. But maybe some stimulations can come up which will contract. We can wish you all praise for that. But that something will definitely come up. Everyone is working on that to stay any physiological lines. So just wanted to say that human soleus is under an adult is capable of sustaining high local rate of oxygen. It doesn't use glycogen and it uses more glucose, VRDL cholesterol and improves both cranial state as a whole. So skeletal muscle, when you are looking at now, is just not good for glucose disposal. When we are talking to the patient or when we are looking at any skeletal muscle mass, it is a significant role in metabolic health. As I said, we are doing very good in starting blood pressure and even through weight management. Now our job is to look into the skeletal muscle, preserve them, improve their muscle function. Thank you so much.